When Aloha Airlines Flight 243 departed from Hilo, Hawaii, on the big island bound for Honolulu on April the 28th in 1988, no one on that flight could have imagined that less than 15 minutes later, the world as they knew it would have changed forever. Immediately behind the cockpit of that aircraft, an 18-foot section of the fuselage peeled away, exposing the terrified passengers to the elements below from almost five miles above the Earth. And tragically, one flight attendant lost her life, and while several of the 90 passengers on board that Boeing 737 sustained serious injuries. Amazingly, however, they all survived that freak incident because in the 13 minutes that it took, took the pilot to make an emergency landing at the Kahului Airport on the next island, some of the passengers prayed, others cried in terrified wails, while others braced themselves while preparing to die in a moment. More lives would have been lost except for the fact that the passengers in the most affected sections of that stricken airliner were all buckled in. It wasn't just COVID-19 that shook our collective world forever over the past few years. Social unrest has jolted our society and the political climate of our nation has become more bitter and toxic and divisive than I have ever seen it during the 60 years since I came to America as a young boy in 1964. Violence and seemingly uncontrollable mass shootings have almost become the norm of the news, de desensitizing our moral fabric with a plague that's similar to the depicted world of the antediluvians in Noah's day. Erratic weather patterns have brought about extreme climactic changes resulting in horrific personal tragedies and the devastations of homes and communities. Today we are living in a global climate of restlessness and uncertainty. And we're certainly not left to wonder whether or not trouble is going to come into our world. There should be no question in our minds that troubles will come. It, it's not a matter of when or if those troubles are going to come, but only when they will impact your life and mine. The prophecy of Scripture assures us that it will certainly come. In Daniel, the 12th chapter in verse 1, Daniel states that at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. In John, the 16th chapter, in verse 33, Jesus reminded his disciples then and down through the ages, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation. And then again in Luke, the 17th chapter, verse 1, Jesus reminded them and he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. The real question that each of us must answer on this Sabbath morning is, are you securely buckled in? The truth is that it isn't to anyone's advantage to live entirely without challenges. In that beautiful book, a classic publication of Ellen White entitled Christ's Object Lessons, she penned this reminder that it is in a crisis that character is revealed. A crisis can be a friend by simply showing us how tightly we are buckled in to Jesus. In John, the 15th chapter and verses 4 through 5, Jesus issued a profound invitation when he said, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. 
He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do how much, folks? Nothing. The world in which you and I are living at this very time is going to shake a lot harder as we approach the return of Jesus. And it is as important as ever that we abide in Jesus through prayer and learning to pray like Jacob did when he pled with God, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We have the privilege. We have the privilege of being strengthened through the time that we spend in quiet reflection on the Word of God. The great psalmist David provided this reminder for us today. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. In every crisis of our lives, we have a direct access to the heart of God as echoed in these words. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. The challenges facing our world and the Seventh-day Adventist church today are a call from God for us to get ready. May God help us to realize that we are living in a time of preparation as opposed to being lulled into a state of complacency. It is now. In this time that we are desperately in need of deepening our loving surrender to God's will and experiencing His presence and His power in our lives. None of us really know. You know, none of us really know what's around the corner, do we? As we watch or realize these troubles as they unfold us, it's our wake-up call to buckle up and to stay buckled, clinging to Jesus as the pilot of our journey as he prepares to safely land us in our heavenly home. He assures you and me on this Sabbath morning, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's coming. Coming soon, I know. Coming back to this earth again, and the weary pilgrims will to glory go when the Savior comes to reign. Yes, he is coming as the Son of God, but far more importantly for you and me, he's coming as the Son of Man. More than any other name, Jesus loved to refer to himself as the Son of Man as his favorite title. Go back with me in time to when you were just a kindergartner in Sabbath school. Do you remember that song that you used to sing about a short little man that desperately wanted to see Jesus? I think you might remember it. I bet you even know the hand motions that go along with it. So for just a moment, I'm going to ask you to become kindergartners here. And let's reminisce for just a moment. Would you sing it with me? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. I knew you knew it. <laughs> Zacchaeus was that wee little man. But in Luke, the 19th chapter and verse 10, as Jesus was being criticized for his role in associating with someone as despicable as a character as Zacchaeus had been, considered as a Jewish traitor aligned with Rome in a class of dishonest tax collectors, Jesus told them very plainly in these words in Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man, came for one reason and one reason alone, to seek and to save the lost. 
However, for us to really explore this expression, the Son of Man, we really need to go back to the Old Testament book of Daniel, which helps us understand more clearly the sonship story of Jesus. In, in fact, much of the New Testament won't really make a lot of sense to us unless we take the visions of Daniel into account. You see, the key figure in Daniel bears the title, the Son of Man, which was the title Jesus used for himself more than any other. In fact, it's referenced more than 90 times in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every time Jesus used that expression, he was identifying himself as that veiled person in Daniel's vision who overturns the power-hungry structures of the world and establishes a new arrangement based upon love and peace. You see, friends, it is important that we see the Bible as a grand storybook. If we just study a part of it, we end up missing the big picture. So, before jumping into Daniel's revelation of the Son of Man, let's consider the backstory leading up to the book of Daniel. In Genesis, the first chapter in verse 26, we learn that God created Adam and Eve and gave them complete dominion over all the earth. In fact, Psalms 115, 16 tells us that the heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Adam and Eve were to rule the world according to their God-given identity as created beings bearing the divine image, that divine image expressed in 1 John, the fourth chapter in verse 16, as God is love. And that was to be embedded into their very fabric as, and the very character of the very first humans fashioned by God's own hand. The tragic fall of mankind that we find recorded in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4 was far more than just a moral fall. It was the fall of God's form of government that he desired not only for Adam and Eve but for generations to follow. Now the earth along with its human inhabitants was under the control of a foreign lord, Satan himself. This is why the Bible assigns these titles to all of the fallen angels who have dominion over the entire world. In John, the 12th chapter, in verse 31, he's referred to as the ruler of this world. In 2 Corinthians, the 4th chapter, in verse 4, he's referred to as the God of this age. In Ephesians, the 2nd chapter, in verse 2, he's referred to as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, by telling us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Paul is not speaking literally as if Satan has control uh, or was in charge of the oxygen supply on earth. What he is saying, rather, is that he is the evil, unseen, spiritual force that feeds on selfish impulses in human beings that affects every culture across the globe. And now, this impacts our social, our economic, our political and moral standards. The world is now under the influence of this dark ruler who prompts a system of government under his image. And once the principle, this principle of selfishness was introduced into the makeup of mankind, our relationships began to disintegrate. In Genesis, the third chapter, Adam aligned himself against his wife Eve in, a, in an effort to preserve himself, giving birth to the blame game. In the very next chapter, Cain murders his brother Abel as the very first recorded act of human violence on this planet. In Genesis chapters 6 through 9, we see a very sad picture in which violence becomes the norm of society, making it necessary for God to intervene with the flood and start all over with Noah and his family. Then in Genesis, the third, 10th chapter, in verses 11, human beings began to consolidate their power after the flood and give rise to mighty men like Nimrod, from whom the very first world empire, Babylon, develops, setting the stage for the world's first monarchy where one man would rule over many. And then... In Genesis chapters 12 through 38, God calls Abram and Sarah out of the land of Babylon to initiate a new form of government based upon self-giving love by promising them a son through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. 
Moving on to finish up the book of Genesis in Genesis chapters 39 through 50, as the story continues, God's covenant is established with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons, but not without the necessity of God's directing their relational dysfunction. Then as we open up the book of Exodus, the story unfolds where Israel is taken into bondage under the dictatorial rule of Egypt, another kingdom of monarchy where one man rules over many and the exploitation of human beings continues. In Exodus, the third chapter, we find God's intervention by delivering Israel from their bondage and their Egyptian bondage, not by a king, but by military might, but by a prophet with a message. From the rest of Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy, we see the people of Israel set free and how God leads them by a system of laws based on love for God and love for each other. And as a prophet and not as a king, Moses organizes Israel under the world's first constitutional legal system, moving them toward understanding that all men are created equal before the law, which was unheard of in a world that only knew the dictatorial rule of kings and pharaohs. I will do marvels as such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation, God explains, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. God's desire was that Israel would operate as a kingdom of priests in order to communicate the knowledge of God's ways to the surrounding nations and attract them into a covenantal relationship of love. The witness to this world was supposed to be very powerful. If obeyed this new form of government based upon a covenant of love, would elevate Israel in every way, spiritually, physically, morally, agriculturally, economically, politically, and relationally. Moses then explains this stunning plan. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all of these decrees and say, surely this is a great nation. This is a great and wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way our, the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I am setting before you today? Keep his decrees and his commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and with your children after you that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. Sadly, it didn't happen. In the record of the first book of Samuel, Israel chose monarchy over a covenantal relationship of love as their preferred system of government, insisting that God needed to give them a king so that they could wage war like all of the other nations. And consequently, rather than attracting other nations, Israel invited hostility, and in due course, they became a nation under captivity once again, this time under the rule of Babylon. It is here, against this historical backdrop, that we meet Daniel as a captive slave in Babylon, and we learn about his fabulous prophecies of the coming of the Son of Man, who will become their long-awaited Prince of the Covenant. In Daniel's prophetic visions, we see a succession of four kingdoms, from Babylon, on to Medo-Persia, on to Greece, and then Rome. And as Daniel maps out the political, the historical transitions from one kingdom to the next, he observes that each empire conquers the other by a means of an ever-increasing display of self-exalting power. The tragic history of human government is an unending cycle of force and greater force with each empire operating on the same principle a rise to power by violence. And sadly today, 
we're watching that same cycle unfold against the innocent lives of the people of Ukraine and Gaza. But the gospel, or the good news according to Daniel, is that this tragic and vicious cycle will be broken. A different kind of king will emerge on the scene of human history, and he will establish a different kind of kingdom. And Daniel writes, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like who, folks? The Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. The prophecies of Daniel are really a study in contrast. Daniel is a book of judgment against the principles of self-exaltation and force. That's the way the kingdoms of this earth and the kingdoms of this world choose to rule. On the other hand, Daniel's book of judgment is in favor of the principles of humility and love by which the coming Messiah would rule. Identifying himself as the Son of Man foretold in Daniel's prophecy, Jesus, before his crucifixion, had carefully described the nature of his kingdom in Matthew, the 20th chapter, and verses 25 through 28. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and, and, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The kings that have dominated the landscape of human time rule by the sheer force of might. Jesus, as the Son of Man, rules by the sheer might of his love. They may take their places on thrones. He took his place on a cross. In Daniel, the 11th chapter, in verse 22, the Son of Man in Daniel's visions is also known as the Prince of the Covenant. Now, folks, that word covenant is simply a biblical word that describes relationships when they are governed by faithful love. Daniel's deep genius is that he presents the stark contrast between the love of power and the power of love, two very diametrically opposite principles of government. Jesus didn't come here simply to win the game. He came to change the game. He didn't come here simply to exert more power than all of the other rulers, but to exert a different kind of power. He came to conquer evil by the power of love alone. When the Old Testament and the New Testament both refer to Jesus as the Son of Man, it is telling us that he is the head, the new head of Adam's race. Not that God alone is going to rule the world, but that God as a man would rule the world. And to do that, the God of this universe, the one who by the power of his voice could speak worlds into existence, condescended to become one of us, not for 33 and a half years, but forever. The one who said, I'm willing to leave it all so that I could be with them and never be separated from them. Just as the prophet Isaiah foretold, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this who is this king? Who 
is this son of man who will overthrow the violent regimes of the world without resorting to violence himself and be established on the throne of David. He is none other than the mighty God, the everlasting Father. The son of man in Daniel's prophetic vision is a king who represents a kingdom that stands in direct contrast to the empires of this world. They rule by war. He rules by love. They rule by taking. He rules by giving. They rule by coercion. He rules by a covenant. I was a student at Southern Adventist University through my sophomore year and during my junior year I decided that I wanted to go overseas and study one year of my theology and history classes and so in 1971 uh, some of my friends at Southern and I decided to to go to uh, New Bowl College in England and and we decided to take our time there and, and study there. I, I know that the, you know, the picture that you're seeing here is a bright sunny day in England but most of the days are not bright and sunny. Many of them are kind of gloomy, actually, cloudy. It was Christmas time. We had been, finished our first semester there, and after we had finished our first semester, we thought, wouldn't it be nice to go home and be with our families for Christmas? But airline flights were expensive, and we thought, you know what? It's only going to go home for two weeks, and, you know, if we go home for two weeks, that's, that's, that's a lot of money to spend on an airline ticket. But what are we going to do? Are we going to stay here and stay in the dorm for, for two weeks and just look at our, you know, just play ping pong in the dorm? Is that, is that what our Christmas vacation is going to be all about? And we thought, well, wait, you know, people there at that time, it was okay to hitchhike, and we thought maybe we'll hitchhike and, and just travel around England and, uh, and do that. But then there was a, a student from Finland who was leaving, and he was going back to his home in Finland, and he said, hey, listen, I have a car. I need to get rid of it. I'll sell it to you. I said, we can't afford a car. We can't even afford a flight to go home. And he says, I'll sell it to you for $150. I said, does it have a steering wheel? Does it have wheels? And he says, oh, yeah, it's a very nice running car. Well, we looked at it. It was a running car. I don't know about saying nice, but we gave it a good car wash, and we didn't even have the money to buy wax to wax on it, and, but it needed something to, to kind of make it shine. And so we went to the cafeteria director and said, hey, do you have any wax that we can use on this car just to kind of give it a little bit of a shine? And he said, all I got here is floor wax. I said, we'll take it. Don't ever try this at home. We put floor wax all over that car. It took us days to get it off. But by the time we were finished with it, you could have thrown mud on it, it would have slid right off. And there's our car. It was a 1952 British Austin. And we said, okay, we've got a car now. We couldn't afford it because we, we, we you know, it was $150 is what he charged us for the car. And I said, Adam, um, why don't we split the car? You pay 75, I'll pay 75, and we'll own it together. So we owned the car together. Then we, you know, thought, well, you know, if we're going to travel, we're going to travel together. Let's uh, find some friends that can ride along with us. And, and so uh, we decided that we would uh, get another two guys to go. So four guys in this car driving all around. I had lost my razor by then. And so uh, I had a little bit more facial hair than I do now. But we, Adam and, uh, and, and Terry and uh, Ed and... Uh, you know, these, these guys, we just decided we were going to just travel all around England and make our way from southern England, where New Bowl College was, into Wales, and then go up into Scotland and then come back. And so that was our plan. And, uh, you know, it was Christmas time, and we were coming into, into Wales, and uh, we just th we're thinking about our families. We were all missing our families. We're thinking about the fact that we'd been just sleeping in that car just to avoid costs. And we thought, well, maybe on Christmas Eve we could get a youth hostel and maybe get a shower. It, we, we needed a shower. And, uh, and so we decided to come into this little town. We were driving into Wales, and we came into this little town. Uh, it was called Betsy Quaid. And we came into this little town, but unfortunately when we arrived in Betsy Quaid, they all the youth hostels were closed. We thought, oh, great. 
we're going to end up spending Christmas in this car, all four of us together, without a shower. It's not good. We thought, well, I wonder if there's a Seventh-day Adventist church anywhere nearby here. Maybe we could call uh, the pastor and see if you know, he knows of a member that we could go to their house and stay over, overnight just for Christmas Eve. We went to a phone booth. You all know what a phone booth is? Okay, yeah. We went and looked up a phone book and then found the Seventh-day Adventist Church there. We thought, wonderful. And so we went to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We drove to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, found it, heard our bath, and when we got there, we were kind of concerned because it said Baptist Church there. And we went to the Baptist Church and we thought, this can't be the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but this is the address. And we knew it wasn't the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the, there was a lady that was vacuuming on Friday night. Christmas Eve that evening happened to be a Friday night and so we went there and we looked around and uh, and the lady uh, we said madam is this the Seventh-day Adventist Church she says oh the Seventh-day Adventists meet in our church they rent our church from us and they meet here and uh, and uh, says, I'm just cleaning up before they come uh, we are actually going to have a joint worship service tomorrow with the Baptists and the Seventh-day Adventists because it's Christmas Day and we're going to have a joint worship service on your Sabbath we told her our plight. We, she said, you know, we said we're, we're students traveling from the United States. We just don't have a place to stay tonight. And we, we're just wondering if we, uh, there was a place that the pastor, says the pastor lives away from here. Uh, many of the people don't live here in Betsy Coed. Uh, by the way, the word Betsy Coed means it's a Welsh house. It's, it means a prayer house in the wood. And I thought, how appropriate because we had prayed that God would help us find a place to stay. And Rachel, the lady who was cleaning the church, said, my husband is right around the corner. Go to his apartment, you know, and go to our apartment and just ask him. He might be able to help you with something. Well, we knew that it was a very small apartment, and he, he was very gracious. His, uh, you know, Mr. Brown uh, was very gracious. His name was Mr. Garth Brown, and, and Mr. Garth Brown welcomed us in, gave us some cookies and milk, and, and said, Listen, I don't, you know, you can see that this is very small and you, you know, you four guys are big guys and, uh, but I do have a camper that's not far, far from here. And so he said, this is Mr. Brown and he just uh, took us to, he says, listen, you all can stay overnight in that camper and then tomorrow morning you come and have breakfast with us and we'll go to church together and have Christmas together. He was very kind and very gracious. We got into the cozy comfort of that camper and we reflected and read the narrative as Adam and Ed and Barry and I sat there in that camper. It had four bunk beds. It had a nice little heater because it was chilly there. And as we sat in that camper, we thought about our families having their Christmas dinner at home. We missed our families. And we realized as we said, you know what? Let's get out our Bibles and let's spend some time reflecting on that old story from the Gospel of Luke. It was on that silent night that we were celebrating just over 2,000 years ago when a humble couple from Nazareth found no room in an inn and how grateful they were for the shelter of a stable. And then we opened the Luke, the second chapter, and, and verse 7 came to our minds. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And although we were thousands of miles away from our families, God had provided us with the comfort of a camper to celebrate our Christmas Eve. But the king of the universe on that first Christmas Eve, a holy night when God became a man, lay as a little helpless baby in a feeding trough for cattle. In John, the first chapter, verse 14, John describes Christ's incarnation in three simple words. He dwelt among us. The Greek word for dwelt is eskonosin, which means to pitch a tent. In other words, he chose to set up his camper with us. 
So affirming and gracefully are the words of God's special messenger in the most beautiful book penned on the life of Jesus Christ entitled The Desire of Ages. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. It was Satan's intentional plan to eternally separate God from man. However, it is in Christ and in Christ alone that we are more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this when the eternal and everlasting and mighty God chose to be one with us forever as the Son of Man. Understanding what heaven's gift to us was in the Son of Man is all about God's amazing love to each of us. Around that same time when I was a student at New Bowl College, a man by the name of John Ralph Wood in 1970 says it best, and he wrote it in these words of this song that many of you who grew up at that time will remember the words of this song. Love was when God became a man, locked in time and space, without rank or place. Love was God, born of Jewish kin, just a carpenter with some fishermen. Love was when Jesus walked in history. Lovingly, he brought a new life that's free. Love was God, nailed to bleed and die and to reach one, love one such as I. Love was when God became a man down where I could see that love that reached to me. Love was God dying for my sin. And so trapped was I, my whole, my whole world caved in. Love was when Jesus rose to walk with me. Lovingly, he brought a new life that's free. Love was God. Only he would try to reach and love one such as I. Many long centuries ago, an old man sat on a rocky and desolate island in the Aegean Sea. And as his mind raced through those wonder-filled years of his youth, a gentle smile came across his face as he woke up to the dawning of a new day. He reminisced about the one whom he had walked with, ate with, slept under the starry night with, and witnessed his miraculous voice and touch and heard words from him that had gripped and changed his heart like no other. Looking across the horizon of sky and sea, John, often referred to as the beloved disciple of Jesus, picked up and unfurled his parchment roll and penned these immortal words for you and me today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. About the same time that John penned these words on the Isle of Patmos, Paul shared his genuine conversion and personal experience about Jesus once he embraced his calling as a faithful apostle as the Lord of his life. And he wrote these words, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth. That, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And many long centuries before John and before Paul, it was the prophet Isaiah who had written this of the one who would be their Redeemer Messiah as the Son of Man. Penned so beautifully in Isaiah the 53rd chapter. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a, as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's the Son of Man that I love and worship. In 1969, when I first started as a student at Southern Missionary College, as it was called, I purchased my very first copy of a book called The Desire of Ages. I was taking a class called teachings of Jesus, and I came across this passage in page 25. I just finished reading the Desire of Ages this week again for the fourth time through. It's falling apart, but I can't let go of that book. I know I can get a new book, but I love that book. I've underlined it, I've highlighted it, and on page 25, there's this one passage. This is what it says. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes, we are healed. But... Robert Francis, our teacher, asked us to do something. He said, change the words on that so that it speaks to your heart. So I went through that paragraph that you see on the screen, and I changed all the words 
so that it spoke directly to me. I want you to do something for me today. I want you to read it the way I have edited it in the Desire of Ages so that it'll speak to your heart this morning. This is the way it reads. Would you read it with me? Christ was treated as I deserve, that I might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for my sins, in which he had no share, that I might be justified by his righteousness, in which I had no share. He suffered the death which was mine, that I might receive the life which was his. With his stripes, I am healed. If you uh, and I want to live in a secure, blessed, and peace-filled life, a life that's filled with hope, I invite you to place a personal relationship with God at the center of your universe. What happens? What happens when you find that gravitational force? You know, our, our solar system revolves around the sun. What would happen to all of those planets if the sun suddenly disappeared? What's going to happen to you when your gravitational force center changes overnight? Sharon Church family, in the yet unknown pages of our lives in the remaining days of 2024 and beyond. What's going to keep you grounded, securely buckled, and moving forward in a predictable pattern when life can change so drastically? If you and I want to live a secure and blessed and peaceful life, I invite you to place that personal relationship with Jesus as the center of your universe. In John, the sixth chapter and verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never go hungry. Now, that's what I call the real wonder bread. In that same passage of scripture, Jesus continues by reminding us that the one who believes in me will never Go, grow thirsty. You know, bread is an essential to life, but water is even more essential than bread. Every cell of your body needs water to survive. And friends, you and I need Jesus every moment of every day to survive. Behold, the Son of Man, who shares the throne of the universe, but longs to have the throne of your heart today. Behold, the Son of Man, whose name is Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Behold, the Son of Man, Sharon Church family. Behold, the Son of Man.